not just the physical, heaven forbid, sure we died in a horrific way, but what did it do to our body in long term, you know, passage of time and to your psyche? How you become a changed person, limited and not fully human in terms of emotional, psychological, and spiritual responses, you become a lot more dehumanized in order to be able to live with the experiences in the memory, visual, auditory, and scent. Do you know when the people are burned all over? It's a horrible smell. And before they were born, even worse. You know, those of you who went to the battlefield and then so on, know that. And this was a whole city turning into that. I don't need to remember. Even though I did, and I do, and I like to forget it. But memory is a cognitive process unless it disappears from your brain cells, will not disappear. So our grief is a complicated grief that we are in a balance of totally cut ourselves off and then not think about it and become less human or suffer and then do something. And suffer part, even if psychically we become limited, pushes up into a realm of soul. And that's where I guess maybe we can come. And that's where maybe we can have your support that you might want to re-examine what is happening to the form of life with indifference to, oh yeah, that was a good, you know, so-and-so. The contingency, when you get your aim accomplished, that some unrelated people must be destroyed. That, that is a very tricky, tricky thing. You know, maybe Adam Smith was right in terms of motivating people with competition so that, you know, we do much better than communes. But you know, I also heard that in terms of human self, that not just the competitive evolutionary self, but that, that there are DNA for cooperation. You know, sharing and incorporating DNA some people are discovered. I am interested how far they can go. I am sure that's there. How can we today have the beautiful Negro spirituals, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was going to show you the, the <laughs> black man who affected me so much. And I was a high school student second year in high school, sat there and wept when I heard him talk. Never heard of anything like that before. You know, his name was James Herman Robinson, Harlem pastor sent by the Presbyterian Falling Board of Mission, going around the world. And he was known for student leadership came to Hiroshima, and dark as a chocolate, you know, and different kind of hair. And then we were going this way. And I was a student leader trying to learn how to train Japanese classmates and under and the members of the student body to become a leader. You know, I mean, I, I was doing the same thing I'm doing today. <laughs> I, I, I said to, to the people, hey, listen, we're in high school once, and it's not going to come back. Let's learn how to lead and think for ourselves. 
<laughs> you trying to get us in trouble? <laughs> no. Well, anyway, so I was looking forward to this guy to give us some kind of a secret. And then he starts to say, oh, you know, instead of going like this, you know, repent, repent, hellfire, <laughs> repent. And, and we're going like this, been there, done that. Hmm. Anyway, so he didn't do any of that stuff. He said, really serious stare. I know you people have pain and suffer. I know you were depressed. But let me tell you, I have really my story of hardships too. So I, you know, I can't imagine what you went through, but I know something about pain and suffering for human race. And he said, just because he was the black man he was thrown in jail, he was beaten up, he couldn't go to school, blamed for everything. And then he said, what usually takes three years of high school, is that four years? Took him seven years to finish. And then, you know, going to Lincoln University, which is a, uh, I don't know about now, but it was a black man's university, uh, college. And then, went to the Union Theological Seminary. He was a brilliant man, so the teachers must have loved him, you know, and encouraged him and mentored him. Look, James, you know, you have a future. And Union Theological Seminary is uh, situated in New York City. So he had an internship in Harlem, and then he had this tremendous ability to raise funds and persuade Eastern, I think first, Jewish people actually, and to uh, help him build wonderful community center, and then summer camps in New England. I, I was a counselor, so I know he's just a fantastic voice. Um, so, he said, all of these things, you know how hard it was that the people just pushed down, pushed down, and then kept on coming up, leaving. And he said, the agent that makes a difference between be just being kept down and then keep on going was to identify with something that's greater than you. And he said for him, it was love of Christ. You know? And I really, really appreciated his approach because it wasn't preaching to us, you know, you repent and then be better and then subordinate yourself to God. It just wasn't anything like that. I think we felt respected for who we were, you know. He didn't say you shouldn't do this or that the other. Anyway, so that's how, when he suggested that I should come to the United States for study in our conversation, I didn't ask for it, okay? I wasn't thinking about no United States, but in relation to the wisdom and what influence you have, this was a major one for me. And then I went to then at college in Greensboro, North Carolina, Methodist Women's School in 1952, before two, year, two years before the Brown versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Believe me, that was a mean sister. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, how can a civilized man pick up a boy and beat him to death and shoot and hang up a man who, there's absolutely no end to it, you know? But if it's institutionalized, I guess there is a testosterone 
or meanness in ourselves. Because I know Thomas Hobbes said that the worst evil is fear of violent death at the hands of other men. This was not that kind of fear to kill. It was recreational for testosterone enjoying the power over other people, like taunting me, these village kids. You know, I mean, they didn't come and grab and hit me or anything, but that's, that's sort of a total, total expansion of one's presence and effect and importance. You know, how we esteem ourselves, how important we are. If we can beat up and then make people crawl, I am, must be pretty important, uh, however it is. And then I have to also tell you, this is in all of us, you know? I mean, I didn't do anything in Bataan Marsh or Pearl Harbor. I love my countrymen dearly. I think that was very stupid for them to have started the war when we couldn't finish and there was no exit strategy <laughs> well worked out. I am not also, you know, lay down and get killed person. Uh-uh. You know, be very vigilant about staying safe and very, very informed about what is going on. I mean, this country is really in pathetic state. I don't think they have enough people to really even surveil, understand what is going on. But that is not where we fail, although that's a big time failure. You know, if you have so much confidence that because you are so big, so wealthy, the wealthiest country in the whole world, I think something leaves you. I don't know how it happens other than those of you who will not change. The quest of ourselves and our esteem of ourselves, how important we are in what we do, I think guides us sometimes to in so many directions that's flawed in terms of an overall human race welfare. Therefore, when this happened, and I wasn't going to show you anything much, but I wanted to play what my daughter did. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, singing for my mother to a tune of Danny Boy. And it will not stay. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe we have to repeat this another time so I have a professional bring it up. Anyway, um, there is grief. You know, there's something like this happens. There is going to be loss of lives and loss of relationships. My mother never came home. I never saw her again. Neither did my cousin, who was like a brother. You know, and I miss her even now. There is just something about really uh, deep grief. You can't make them as if it didn't happen, you know. Especially when you see how others' demise seem like. How difficult it must have been. How terrible it must have been. For and you weren't there to say, Oh, Ma, I'm so sorry. I love you, I love you, I love you. 
or my cousin Hideyuki, oh, I'm so sorry, brother. You know, stroke, stroke him and rub him and then give him water, something, right? That's human beings. Ritual way of being able to let go. Hey, when you don't have it, you can't let go. I'm sorry. I couldn't let go. I still have it. And it's part of my grief. I'm sorry. But, you know, that's war. And then it happens. Like I, I saw in a Facebook, someone's son disappeared out in scuba diving. And then it was um, anniversary. And it's, the father was having a terrible time. You know? And I come to realize, and this is a, the worst picture you will see in this book after the fire sees what the place looked like. And the only thing, I think, this is really my sentiment. There's a little girl crying all alone. It says, many people had burns. Many people died. That's all it says. It doesn't say we went this way and then, you know, like some people died right in front of me. No. Open-minded, ready to think, people, trying to put what it must have been like if you, we were uh, in their shoe. That's absolutely necessary for us to be able to do that. And we try to start to reconstruct with little pieces of things that we can collect. And I had examples of, uh, you know, all kinds of things we did. I was in grade school, six, I, I nearly died with uh, radiation sickness. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't know how I got saved, but this, this, this is a little story. Um, you know, my fevers went off the chart. And, and, and I just lay there and nobody could do anything. And my aunt, who lived in um, Shikoku Island and was an innkeeper, Jap now, I don't know if you have any knowledge about Japanese inns. To be innkeeper, you really have to be very strong. And this was a 14th generation inn. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so. She married into a very tough position. It's a, it's a, uh, they call it okami, you know, the innkeeper wife. It, it, okami usually is given to uh, superior, or your superior, or uh, the, the emperor, or government. She held and wielded a lot of power, and, and you know, the family was very wealthy, so she was friends with wives of prime ministers. Uh, I remember uh, it was a time of uh, Prime Minister Ikeda, Ikeda Yujin, Yujin Ikeda. She was a friend of his wife, and then Prime Minister Ohira. He was a um, um, foreign cabinet minister first, and then became prime minister. Anyway, so in Reconstruction, we had worked together, and believe me, I'm sure you would have too, 
if you had seen maybe in Civil War time, you know, trying to make new life with all that you had. And Japanese men and women did that. Really, really worked hard. So, then comes, this is the abstract, important abstraction that I want you to know that the author put in. See the guy who looks like a foreigner? wandering in, yeah. and immediately, and somebody, you know, probably say, how did they know that he comes from the blah, 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 but this old guy says, it's all your fault, everything just got ruined, you know, and start taunting him. A visitor from the faraway country, oh, okay, it is explained, drop the bomb, maybe I changed it to put it in, wandered in. One neighbor who saw him shouted, it's your fault that everything got ruined. Visitor's expression turned sad. But as far as I was concerned, this is our attitude for any foreigners or people of ethnicity. You know, doesn't have to have dropped any bomb. This is already made, you know, you look at the birds I am looking, sort of like these come, and then they come, and then they fly away. They're very skittish, and I think so are we. Very skittish about people who are different. Yeah. Okay, and then this is a test. People, I want you to know what this abstract this simple action in abstract is demanding. Another couple uh, says, oh, come on in, and offer tea and cakes. And then said, I don't know, what's you know, so big about it? I mean, you have, we, our country's fought, but we're friends. And, the man says, arigato. And he takes out a pouch, and they say, what is it? It's a seed. And as soon as he gave it to him, he leaves. Okay. This is a test. <coughs> for us, because it's very hard to do what they did. You know, I know the number of survivors feel very, still very, very hurt that the United States government considered dropping of the bomb, ended the war, and was a wonderful thing because it brought peace. You know, they're still truly grieved about that. Okay? But even though it's very natural and understandable, it doesn't meet the test of going forward with just that. And the Catholics who were persecuted in a Kyushu Island, warlords chased them into a boiling hot spring water, pushed them over cliffs, and they became hidden Christians. These are Catholics, the St. Xavier uh, affected. Um, and they have, to this day, a hymns. They call it Orasho. In an oration, and then I read, what are they saying? You know, because I was interested in grief and mourning, and I was thinking, well, I can learn something. Well, I learned something, but not to do the same thing. It was saying, oh God, oh God, why did you let them do this to us? 
<laughs> I don't know if they knew what they are singing, but hundreds of years they've been singing this, oh God, what did, did, did you let her do this to us? You get stuck there. Well, maybe they didn't know what they were singing, but if they understood it, you'd be stuck there. So the concept that I want to convey, you have to meet the test of transcending yourself to face the perpetrator. All right? Whoever they are. Whatever business you have that you have tremendous difficulty with, I don't say forgive and then subordinate and, you know, no. Come and have discourse. And by opening yourself, you have an opportunity, a possibility for authentic relationship, authentic connection, or connection and healing. But you're not going to get there if you're stuck in, oh God, why did you let them do this to me? And I still suffer, suffer, suffer. And all of that is quite true. I still do suffer. I still miss my mom. And I still don't have much of a feeling in certain ways. On the other hand, I've had huge amounts of hope, huge amounts of healing that would not have been possible. And many, many times, it, you know, I was a clinical social worker, licensed clinician. And so I put my absolutely 200% into it. And um, many people told me that their lives would change. 